Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. We're going to study the first 14 verses. But we're going to start, and you couldn't, probably wouldn't be, well, maybe we can't. I guess we might as well. Then we'll get the picture and then we'll fill in the blanks. How's that? <clears throat> Matthew 22, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. We're going to study the first 14 verses. But we're going to start, and you couldn't, probably wouldn't be, well, maybe we can. I guess we might as well. Then we'll get the picture, and then we'll fill in the blanks. How's that? <clears throat> Matthew 22, verse 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Praise God. Now you should think about that. Whew. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went into the highways, and gathered together, Together, all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Praise God. You can be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to be studying this morning on the marriage of the king's son. The marriage of the king's son. And this lesson, in a nutshell, if you really want to know what this lesson's about, God sent an invitation to Israel to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb of God and they made light of it. And he is choosing a bride out of the Gentiles for his name. Out of the hedges, the highways, byways, and everything he can find to bring to that wonderful occasion of the Lamb of God. That is the focus of the lesson this morning. Now you think about this, in the eyes of many people, many folks right now, Brother Johnny, Brother Smith, especially the high people on the totem pole as far as finances or prestige or whatever, they look at Christians with disdain, like Christians weren't worth much. Praise God. And they don't think that we're very much but they don't know that our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Nevertheless, an invitation, you know, an invitation to this wedding that we're talking about here is made light of by a lot of folks. Made light of by a lot of people. I wouldn't expect, for example, to be invited to the president's daughter's wedding. Would you? They wouldn't invite you to Queen Elizabeth's uh, son's wedding, would they? No, they wouldn't. 
praise God, or any other well-to-do. Some folks wouldn't even invite you to their son's wedding. But we're invited to a wedding this morning. A wedding that is more important than Prince Charles, the President of the United States. The Spirit of God is inviting everyone, whether they be vile, ugly, skinny, fat, rich or poor, God is inviting people. He can take some of the lowest class people, some of the harlots on skid row, some of the dope addicts out there on in an alley somewhere about to give up their life, freezing to death in Canada or wherever, Alaska, or in the winter in Chicago, Illinois. He could take some of the most vilest people and make them kings and priests. President, the President of the United States can't do that. Queen Elizabeth can't do that. But God can. He can take something out of nothing. He can make something. He can mold it into something beautiful. And God is desired to do that. But notice this. In an oriental marriage, listen to this, it always took place at the home of the bride. Okay, these parables, we're talking about Israel 2,000 years ago, okay? In that day and hour, the wedding took place at the, at the home of the bride. I know you may not understand this, probably... And you may not necessarily agree with it, but don't disagree on anything until you search out all the facts and look at the picture. But I believe that the marriage of the Lamb will take place when He comes back and sets up His millennial kingdom. Because He told His apostles, He said, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you, new with you in my Father's kingdom. You see? And the kingdom of God is going to be set up here on this planet for a thousand years. Most folks I've heard preach think that the marriage supper takes place when the rapture takes place. But all the resurrection is not completed when the rapture takes place. You hear me? All the resurrection is not completed when the, when the, when the rapture takes place. Because the Bible said in Revelation, the 20th chapter, about the 4th and 5th verse, it says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So if there was not saints during that period of time, during the reign of the mark of the beast, they could not have given up their lives and be beheaded for the witness of Jesus. The Bible said when the angel came in the 14th chapter of Revelation, he said, I saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven saying, Worship not the beast, nor his image. And if any man worship the beast, his image, the same shall be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb for eternity. But he said, Right, blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. The resurrection is not completed until... The people that were martyred during the tribulation are raised from the dead at the end of the tribulation when the devil's bound for a thousand years. Then it's completed. And the people in Israel that have given their life and, and the other nations of the earth that are, uh, that are here, I don't know exactly how the scene's going to go. And I'm not wanting to miss the rapture because I don't know if a person even could be saved after that. But there's going to be people saved during the tribulation according to the scripture. A person had to be blind and ignorant not to see it. Plain as day. But the thing about it is, during this period of time, people that die for God, they are still going to be in His resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part on, in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But the reason I'm saying this is because it's completed then. This is the first resurrection. That's what it said. Read it. Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5, I think it is. And he said... When it's completed, then the marriage supper will take place. Because then all the people that are intended to be resurrected, to be in Christ with a glorified body will be complete. The marriage supper wouldn't be complete 
without the people of the tribulation that gave their lives for God. It wouldn't be complete. Hallelujah. Well, I'm telling you some facts this morning. Praise God. And the thing about it is, the marriage supper, I believe personally, will take place on this earth during the millennial reign of Christ, when he comes back and all the Armageddon, all that stuff's over with, then he's getting ready to take uh, the fruit of the vine anew with us in the Father's kingdom. Praise God. All the stuff's going down on tape. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now in this parable, it's the Bible said the king, verse 1 and 2, Verse 2 especially here, it says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. This king in this parable is the great Spirit of God. The Spirit of God that created the universe alone spread by the earth by himself. He made a marriage for the lamb, the body that he was going to come and dwell in. Jesus Christ was man in flesh and God in spirit. He was two natures fused together into one person. That's why he was called the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Is because he is both the begotten Son of God and also the eternal Spirit of God. Because God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19 Alright. And we know the Son is Jesus Christ. The man. Christ Jesus. The human Christ Jesus. God made a marriage for this lamb. God made a marriage for son. Now you can see this. It's not too hard to see, is it? Is it hard to see? No, that's pretty simple. Praise God. He sent forth, now notice this. He invited some guests in verse 3. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. The invited guest in this parable was none other than Israel. God invited them first. The Bible said up to the time of the gospel that it was to the Jew first and then to the Greek. But Exodus 19.5, the scripture talks about Israel said, Ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. So God was inviting Israel to this wedding of the Lamb. He was inviting them with great love. Deuteronomy 14.2 says, They were a holy people above all the nations that were upon the earth. But you notice, God has always had unconditional promises and He's always had conditional promises. When it comes to being at this marriage feast, the supper of the Lamb of God, it is conditional promise. Not everybody's going to be there, church. Praise God. Not everybody is going to be there. Some folks said if a person don't intend to go to heaven, he won't go. Praise God. The intent of the heart of a person has to be to be in that number getting ready to leave. It can't be no maybe so or I'll just lay down and sleep and God will take me. That's, that's fallacy hatched up by the devil and his angels in these last days. The scripture says here, if you will keep will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Do you hear that? If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. This was a conditional promise. The Bible said the soul that sinneth it shall die. If a man does righteousness all of his life and then commits iniquity, every bit of the righteousness that he did will not be remembered anymore. Praise God. But if a man, on the other hand, commits iniquity and is a devil first class and he repents and gets it right, all that wicked that he did won't be remembered anymore. Only people who remember people's past lives is men and women. God don't remember sins forgiven. Hallelujah. Cast them behind his back where he can't see them. Praise God. Praise the Lord. James 1, 22, that you can read 22 through 25 when you get home because that's a, a good thing. But the scripture said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And what's the next verse to say? Deceiving your own selves. Oh, I love that. I love that. I wish God just turned me inside out. I don't want to be wicked. I want to be holy. I want to love God and I want to walk with him in white. I want to be at that marriage supper. 
And by the grace of God, I'm going to be. Hallelujah. My wife didn't save me. My girl didn't save me. And none of my boys saved me. And if they all go to hell, I'm going to go to heaven. Because Jesus saved me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, Jesus saved me. I found a love that I never had before. And I'm not trading it for the world. Praise God, hallelujah. He said he sent forth, now notice this, his servants. Do you remember that? God sent forth his servants to the invited guest. I'm not losing anybody, am I? The servants that Jesus Christ in spirit sent to Israel was the prophets. Listen. He sent the prophets to Israel to invite them, to warn them, to tell them about the things that God hath prepared for them that love Him. Scripture said in 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you see, God had some wonderful people sent to invite His children Israel to that great marriage supper. The word was to the Jew first. We remember studying our uh, scriptural lessons in the past where God called Abraham, which was a son of Terah, and they were idolaters. They worshipped idols of all types. And he called him out of this idolatry and gave him hope in God and got a man to believe God. Just think about it. I was reading something the other day, some statistics. Adam and Eve were two people. They had Cain and Abel. Cain slew Abel, killed his brother. Seth was another righteous seed that took the place of Abel. So there was Adam and Eve, which were taught by God to offer sacrifices that was blood in it. And I listen to this. Out of two people... Two righteous seeds of the boys, one righteous, one wicked rather, and the mom and dad was new righteousness after God clothed them with skins. Multiplied, Adam lived 930 years. Multiplied up on the face of the earth until probably millions of people was upon the face of the earth. And eight people were saved. In Noah's day out of all them people. Hallelujah. Eight souls were saved in Noah's day out of all them people. Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they planted, they bought, they sold until the flood came and took them away and they didn't know it. Hallelujah. We're living in a day and hour. If you, if you sat there and looked at the Bible, said there was ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many there be which go in there at. I'm afraid that this generation has fooled itself. I'm afraid that it's, the, the, it's fooled itself and the Bible said evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. If we were going to get a hold of God, church, we need to make it solid and make it real because God's going to come back only for a people that have made themselves ready. Glory to God. He sent the prophets to Israel. Called Paul Abraham and gave him faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, they led his people all through. There were some good leaders and plenty of bad leaders. But God chose these folks, folks first. But now, I just want to let you know this from a scriptural standpoint, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male, bond nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. Praise God. God has no preeminence over Jew or Gentile, black, white, or whatever. We all got the same opportunity this morning to live for him. Praise God. Verse 4. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. See here? 
Look at God with His plea of imitation. Hey, I've got all these things killed. I've got beautiful banqueting tables. Food is plentiful. Plenty of drink, plenty of happiness, plenty of joy. Come to the marriage. See, God is trying to reach out to people. God wants us to go to heaven. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They kept on turning him down. We hear a lot of people now say, well, they make fun of Jews. They make fun of them because, well, they killed Jesus. Or them people, if you want to know something about them, man, you ever seen a poor Jew? You know, I mean, this all types of stuff. Or you've heard the old expression, Jew him down. You know, that came from some slang type thinking to ridicule Israel and the Jew. People ridicule them because they killed Jesus. Because they rejected the Messiah. But you look at the day and age we're living in. You just look at it. We're getting a solemn invitation this morning to this wedding feast. And it would behoove us to make our calling and election sure this morning. Praise the Lamb of God. The Bible said in John, the first chapter, about the 11th verse, He said He came unto His own, which was Israel. And His own received Him not. Came unto His own. Can't you imagine? Going, He said it, He came to Israel. Matthew 15, 21. Listen to this. Jesus said in verse 24, this is 15, 21 through 28, but verse 24 says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus wasn't sent to Gentiles, folks. He was sent to Israel. Matthew 10, verse 5 and 6, when Jesus ordained His apostles, He said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go ye rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Praise the Lord. They rejected His servants. They kept on rejecting the apostles. They rejected everything Jesus said. They rejected the prophets of old. This is what verse 5 and 6 says. Here they rejected the king's servants, but they made light of it and went their ways. Folks, you don't make light of the eternal Spirit of God. I said we don't make light of the eternal Spirit of God. They made light of it. One of them went their ways to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. They were all time killing the prophets. All time. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings? But you would not. God. Jesus. God trying to reach to our spirit this morning. God's trying to reach into our heart. Can we feel Him? Can we feel after Him and find Him? He's trying to reach us. Israel as a nation rejected God. Hebrews 11, 35 through 38. Listen to what it says about His servants. Women received their dead, raised their life again. Others were tortured. Did you hear that? Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. In other words, they said, you'll deny God or we'll kill you. No, you go ahead and do it. It says they wouldn't accept deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Glory. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Was thrown in jail, beat with a whips, mocked. They were stoned. 
They were sawn asunder. That someone said they cut Isaiah in two. They were tempted, slain with the sword. They wandered about. Do you think it's, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented? This is his servants, church. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in caves, dens and caves of the earth. And on down it says, of whom? The world was not worthy. Hey, folks, this world is not worthy of the saint of God. We are the salt of this earth, and this world is not worthy. And God is going to take us out of here pretty soon. You're going to leave a lot of folks behind, crying and begging for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them and hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the coming Lamb of God and the clouds of heaven. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Some folks in this generation will say, well, I'm not like that. Not every single person in Israel is like that. They just made light of the invitation and went about doing their own thing. Some folks said, I ain't got time to serve God. I, I'm too busy living my life. I want to enjoy life for a while. I want to have a little fun. I want to do my thing. And it don't even have to be evil. It don't even have to be evil. Some folks get involved with their business. Some folks get involved with their job. And the, all they think about is that. But they don't think about the invitation. And they make light of that. They might not say, I make light of the invitation, but their actions speak louder than their words. God weighs the actions of people, he said. He don't weigh what we say, he weighs actions. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, God, in your name. Listen to what it said here in Second Timothy 3. Brother Johnny remembers this scripture real well. 3, 1 through 5 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Jesus. Covetous. Boasters. You seen all these cool people? Boast, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Unholy. I don't care what this world does. I don't care what this world does. I care about individual souls. Don't get me wrong. But if the world wants to go to hell, it can go to hell. But I'm going to live for God. I said, I'm going to live for God. Noah preached over probably around 100 years. Someone in that area. Eight souls. He just saved his family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Without natural affection, truth speakers, false accusers, despisers of those that are good. How many can relate to that? You ever worked on a job? Don't they just love you because you got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and you don't cuss like they do? You don't smoke on the job? Don't they love you for that? No, they don't. They despise those that are good. They're, the Bible says they're traitors. <laughs> Stab you in the back of a New York second. Thank God for the knife. High-minded, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You see the churches on every corner. They deny this power of the Holy Ghost. Some folks, my wife said this morning, or my boy or somebody said something about a certain denomination of people. They were, they were dead or something. I said, well, you can't be anything but dead when you're taught to be dead. 
Hallelujah. They teach them that they got to be dead. That's exactly what they're saying. They're denying this power of the Holy Ghost. And they're telling people it's not for you, it's of the devil. They're teaching people, hey, you got to die. That's their doctrine. You're dead. Praise God. Jesus. We're seeing a world right at this point, present time that is rejecting God. Everywhere around us, they're rejecting Him. They're making light of the marriage. Making light of it. When a preacher preaches sometime, he's preaching to the hearts of people. And people don't respond. The preacher feels that rejection and that shrugging of the shoulder and saying, don't bother me. But making light of this eternal spirit ain't no joke. Treating this thing like it was a, a game that people play is no joke. Games people play over night and every day, never meaning what they say, never saying what they mean. They while away the hours in their ivory towers until they're covered up with flowers on the back of a black woman's hand. But don't you to notice how God responded to those people making light of his wedding invitation. The king got mad. Verse 7, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. Or was he got angry? God's slow to anger, but you know God's patience can actually be wore out. Does anybody believe that? The Bible said, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Scripture said, Because you would none of my reproof, you said it not all my counsel. You wouldn't listen when a preacher preached. You wouldn't listen when the Holy Ghost dealt with you. He said also, he said, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear comes upon you. He told Israel, said, you turned to other gods. You kept on turning to them, and you repented and turned back to me. He said, I'm not going to even hear your prayers no more. So you go and cry to them gods and see if they'll deliver you. God said that. This is my God that I'm preaching about this morning. I get offended when I see people mess with my God. I don't care who it is. When I see people play with my God and think that he's some kind of old grandpa that can do any way, it offends me. And I don't, I don't think I have to put up with it because I can pray in the Holy Ghost for them people's souls. They need God. You're talking about touching one of my kids and slapping him. That's one thing. I don't like that. Nobody else does. But when you slap God in the face, tell me that you don't love God by the way you act. You offend me. And I don't like it. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ don't like it. He was mad at those people. I can't stand to hear them people always having a bucket of honey toting around telling people that it's all love and all happiness and all peace and you don't have to worry about God. He ain't going to do anything for you because he's slow and merciful and tender and he is. But people can get to the place where God will pull out a switch in a spirit and he'll get their attention one way or another or take them out of this planet praise God I believe God's going to restore judgment to the church the Bible teaches that and an Sapphira lied about some money that they used for church Sold some land and kept back part of the money and said, well, this is all the money we got for it and brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet. He said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie with the, to the Holy Ghost? And he fell dead and they drug him out. His wife came in a little bit later. He says, did you sell the land for so much money? She said, yeah, so much. He said, why is it you've agreed with your husband to tempt the Spirit of God? You see? 
And if she fell down dead, said the same people that carried your husband out is going to carry you out. And God killed them people. You don't hear preachers preach no more. You don't see things happen no more. That's why the people lost their fear of God. The Bible said the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise instruction. God's going to send two prophets back and their fire is going to come out of their mouth and devour their enemies. Hallelujah. God's prophets. Jesus' name. He finally sent forth 70 A.D. I know you're all familiar with this data, but this is for the tape. Sent forth Titus and all the Roman armies and destroyed Israel. Pulled every piece of material in that building all to pieces. Just pulled it down. It burnt all the gold and all that stuff. Melted. God did it. I said, God did it. The devil caused this to happen. Something God caused this to happen because of people's rebellion. I don't believe all this stuff. They blame everything that happens evil on the devil. Because God is the one. He said he puts down one, he brings up another. He said in the cup, of the, in the Lord's hand there's a cup. It's full of wine. He said and it's red. And he said I'm going to take it, I'm going to pour it out. His judgments and all the bottom dregs that you see in the cup. He said I'm going to make the wicked drink it. He said he's going to give them blood to drink for they're worthy. Give them double according to their works. God's going to send plagues on this earth like this earth has never seen before. The Bible said when the judgments of God are in the land, people will learn righteousness. You see an earthquake happening and everything falling to pieces around you, I guarantee you this whole town would get on their knees and pray if they thought they were going to be swallowed up. As soon as it's over and the fear is gone, a lot of them will curse God. In that siege of Jerusalem, a thousand or a million were killed, a million were starved, and a million were sold as slaves. Isaiah 40, 15. The scripture said, even the nations are a drop of a bucket. Did you hear that? Even the nations are a drop of the bucket. And are counted as sm the small dust of the balance. He taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Think about this. The nations are just like a drop of a bucket. Nations to God. Like dust. And we got people, they can argue with each other, but said, don't let them argue with their maker. Let the potsherds argue with the potsherds, but not with the creator. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus in your name. When the kingdom of Babylon was ready to be judged by God, now notice this, when it was ready to be judged by God, he sent forth the Medes and the Persians and killed Belshazzar. Remember? He then took all the vessels out of the house of God and Solomon's temple and they were eating and drinking and feasting and drinking the wine in the temple of God and praising the gods of gold. All of a sudden, God's hand started writing on the wall. Jesus. God sent forth the armies to destroy Jerusalem church. It wasn't the devil. Jesus' name. Ezekiel 38, 16 says, I will bring thee against my land. God said this, I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in the O Gog before their eyes. This modern church world has got their wires crossed. Do you hear me? This modern church world has got their wires crossed according to this book. They say if a tornado comes, it's the devil. Hallelujah. God sent some things and killed all of Job's kids. He allowed the devil to do it. Praise God. Well, said it was the devil. But God allowed it to happen. Praise God. I know that that's pretty, pretty tough, isn't it? Jesus, when God says... 
to the universe. Bow down. The universe bows at God's commands. How much more USA, Russia, Mexico, whatever. How much more you and me. That hurts me. Jesus is preaching to them people, Brother Johnny. He said from when he got pre through preaching, he says they started going back and wouldn't even, some of his disciples wouldn't even walk anymore with him. He turned to the, his own 12 that he spent all night in prayer receiving revelation on who to receive as there is a 12 apostles. He turned to those 12 and said, would you also go away? Jesus was, he was serious about this thing. He's serious about this, this wedding feast too, church. Notice what it says here about being worthy. Matthew 22, verse 8. Then said he unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. When Jesus comes, there will be a separation of the worthy and the unworthy. The unworthy will be destroyed at the judgment of the nations. The unworthy will be destroyed at the judgment of the nations. Matthew 25, verse 1 through 14 tells us about the parable of the ten virgins. It was getting ready to go into the marriage supper. Five were wise and five were foolish. And only the wise had oil, which represented their prayed up burning lamp of the Holy Ghost. When the bridegroom came, they were the only ones that was ready out of ten. It's just a parable. There's more than ten people going. I know that. More than five people, but there it's a parable letting us know that not everybody's going. Matthew twenty five, thirty one through forty six tells us when the king comes, Jesus Christ, he's gonna sit on the throne of his glory, and he's gonna put the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. Listen to what Daniel seven and nine nine and ten says. You can you can keep this scripture because it's the same scene in Daniel 7 verse 9 and 10 it says I beheld to the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days which is Jesus did sit the ancient of days billions and billions and billions of years old you can't ever count the number he's so old because he's from eternity to eternity whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. <laughs> oh, an awesome God we serve. His throne was like the fiery flame. His throne was like the fiery flame. And his wheels as burning fire. That's what Ezekiel saw. He didn't see the Holy Ghost. A wheel in the middle of wheels. Poor some poor preacher thought. But he saw God's chariots that pulled him through the heavens and he rode up on a cherub and did fly. He said his wheels as burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Only the worthy will go in to the marriage supper. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Let no man deceive you. Don't deceive yourself. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Well, that's a clincher in it. Hello. Said so there's nobody righteous. Not in our own self, we may not be, but in Christ Jesus, we are righteous, or we're not going to heaven. The Bible said all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Take a scripture in from it was concerning Israel when they were in a backslidden condition. But the Bible said, let no man deceive you. New Testament, 1 John. 
He that doeth righteousness, third chapter, is righteous even as he is righteous. As he ought, as he walked, we ought so, so to walk even as he walked. This is King James this morning. It's not the revised edition. It's not the book of imagination. God commands us to be holy. The only way we'll be holy is we pray, pray and live for God and love His Word. It's the only way we'll be holy. Hallelujah. Y'all have to forgive me this morning if I seem emotional, because I am. Jesus said, Strive ye enter to enter in at the straight gate. Luke 13, 24. Striving for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1, 27. That means to labor to enter into heaven. Labor to strive in prayer. To strive to enter into that gate. To labor to try to get into heaven. I can't stand to hear these New Testament, these new generation mama called daddy sent false prophets and false apostles, angels of light. I can't stand to see them sit and just constantly talk about you ain't going to ever be no good. You're not going to be righteous. You're not going to, you know, just, I can't stand to hear them talk like that about God. God commands us to be righteous. He commands us to seek his face forevermore. Pray without ceasing. Men ought to always pray and not to faint. Building up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, watching thereunto with all perseverance for all saints. Persevere. For all saints. Paul said, making mention of you in my prayers night and day. Hey, I'm not having even got this written down. It's just the Holy Ghost. Jesus' name. Jesus, listen to this. Luke 21, 36, you say, well, nobody can be worthy. Jesus said, watch you therefore and pray always. That you may be accounted worthy. Those that were not, that were bidden, Jesus said, were not worthy. So they're not going to taste of his supper. Worthy. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Hello? Worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand before the Son of Man. And notice in verse 9, the highways and the hedges. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. Us poor Gentile folks are invited. We've been grafted into that good olive tree. Jesus said in John 10, 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Talking about Israel. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they shall be, hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's what Paul meant when he said he broke down the middle wall of partition between us that we should be one body in Christ. Jews and Gentiles, that there would be no difference. Jesus said there'd be one fold and one shepherd. Concerning Israel, Paul said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? He asked a question. Did God cast away his people? God forbid. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. It's Romans 11, verse 1, 15, 21, 26. You see, God let blindness come up on Israel because they rejected Messiah, but it's not forever. He's going to go back to Israel. And it says if they're falling means the riches of us poor old Gentiles. They fell. And we would have had a chance to receive those riches and we're making light of it. I said we're making light of it. 
God cut off his own people. That he chose and brought them out of heathenism and made them a nation. He cut them off and let them die as a nation. That we might be grafted in. If we're making light of that same invitation. Playing with God. Tell you this morning, I feel God in my soul. I feel, I feel, I feel a move of God in my spirit. It's God's love, and He wants us to go to heaven. We got to let people know, Brother Johnny, you're gonna go over there, at Sister Vicky's home, pretty soon. You got to let them know. There's a lot of those folks that don't have no idea what the Holy Ghost is. As far as, you know, experience. They've heard about it, I'm sure, from Sister Vicky. But they don't know, but we gotta let people know the marriage is ready. Hey, the feast is being wine on the leaves, well refined. Fruit of the vine is gonna be drank. My God, we're gonna have a great time during that thousand year reign, aren't we, church? Hmm. You don't hear people preach much about this thousand year reign, do you? It's a beautiful study. Beautiful study. God's got great plans for planet Earth. I say God's got great plans after He takes and destroys all the sinners out of it. 13th chapter of Isaiah. I will destroy all the sinners out of it. Bring those people that would not that I should reign over them unto me and let me slay them. Jesus said that. Let me kill them. He said, he said, bring those and slay them before me. That's what he said. He's going to wet his glit, glister. He's going to sweat or get it. You know what wetting a knife is. He said, I'm going to wet my glittering spear. My hand's going to take hold on judgment. God said this. We don't know about all this, do we? There's a study of the tribulation period all through the Bible that's beautiful. It will enrich people's lives if we would study it. Because it shows the great things God's doing and what He's going to do during the tribulation period to shake this earth and get people to, that can be saved repent. Someone said the mark of the beast is a blessing in disguise because it's going to force people to make a decision. Some people, you, you be kind to some people, Brother Charles, and try to show them love and mercy in their adversity, and they'll sit there and just laugh at it. Sometimes God has to take something and go, <laughs> to get their attention. Some folks said, a mule will do anything you want to, but you first got to take this axe handle and get his attention. And God is famous for pulling the rug at the right time to get people's attention. I promise you that God knows how to pull a string. Just when you think your, your world is so big and powerful and wonderful, He's able to pull that string and make it collapse right up under you and you'll cry like a baby. Hallelujah. I had that happen to me one time. And I thought I was so big in Nashville, Tennessee. I was running with everything. I had a skirt on, drinking, man doing everything I thought I was big enough to do. God pulled the stopper out of my sink and the water went out. And I was in jail, deranged, crying and begging for somebody to help me to know what to do. But you see, I thank you, Lord. I thank you. Because, because of him bringing me to my knees, I'll never forsake him. There's something about that I ain't never letting go. Because I'm so glad that one day he knew how to get me to turn my heart toward him. It was through judgment. It was through chastening. But because of it, I'm holding on to that nail-scarred hand. And he's going to take me through. Glory, glory, glory. <laughs> Praise God. Verse 10, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. The bad are mentioned first, for they are the greatest in number. You look at Cain. Now, we told you this while ago. Cain and Seth, two people, 
And at the time of the flood, only eight people were saved, were worthy to be saved. The wedding garment, verse 11 and 12. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having on a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Have you ever heard someone say, well, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Catholic or I'm, I'm just as good as they are or, or I, I try to do the best I can. Or You've heard that type of talk all your life, haven't you? Trying to get people to come to church. I do the best I can. The Bible says the fine linen, white and clean, is the righteousness of the saints. This is the wedding garment. White linen. White linen. Jesus. Ain't that great? Mm -mm. The man, I want you to notice this, the man was not prepared and he knew it. He was not prepared to meet the king's son. He was not prepared. He didn't have on his wedding garment. He knew that he didn't have it on because when the guy came in, he was speechless. When it comes time for us to stand before God, if we don't have that wedding garment on, which is a fine linen of God, we'll be speechless. Nebuchadnezzar, or Belshazzar rather, his knees smote together when he saw that hand writing on the wall. And when we look at that white throne with a face that shines brighter than the sun, we will tremble, tremble, tremble if we don't have on that wedding garment. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If we don't know, and I notice this, he wasn't prepared and he knew it, but if we don't know what it takes to get to heaven, we need to find out, for at that day there won't be any excuse. You might say, well, I didn't hear a Pentecostal message. I didn't go down there to a Pentecostal church and hear about Acts 2.38 being baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. I didn't hear that. It'll make no difference at that day whether you heard it or not. Hallelujah. I said it won't make any difference that day whether we heard it or not. We'll still be judged according to the words which I've spoken. They will judge you at the last day, Jesus said. It don't matter if we've heard them or not. He'll still judge us because the books will be opened. Praise God. Jesus' name. I'm almost finished, church. 13 and 14. The king called his servants, which are the angels. Notice this. These servants in this particular phrase here is the angels. The Bible says the reapers are the angels. Matthew 13, 39. At the end of the world, the reapers are the angels. Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few chosen. Called and chosen. Many hear the gospel. Some make us start and then they quit. And some never even start. We must not only hear and start, but we must have on a white wedding garment to be chosen. Ephesians 5, 25-27, the Bible said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of, with the washing of water by the word that he might present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You hear that? There's that wedding garment. See, it's a bride. It's a wife. And he gives us a husband and wife type of an analogy here. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what he's coming after. He ain't coming after some old snaggletooth harlot on Skid Row. Spiritually speaking, I'm talking about. He's coming back after a church that has made herself ready. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Jesus God. The Bible says in James 1, 27, says, but pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself un, 
spotted from the world. Praise God. Revelation 19, verse 7 through 9, through 9 said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb, notice, is come. It has come at that present time. Oh, she's getting ready. He said, And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Praise the Lord. These are the true sayings of God. Second Peter 3.11 It says, Seeing then, talking about the earth being burned up and all the elements there and the heavens being on fire. It says, Seeing that then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ye ought to be, ought ye to be, in all holy conversation and godliness. Seeing what manner of person we ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You got on the wedding garment this morning? Are we ready for that marriage? Isn't this rich? Hey, this is truth this morning. This is a good parable. And it's got some good doctrine in it. Some good knowledge in it. And it really has enriched my heart this morning to go through it. I want to give you this last scripture. It said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye that not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's something to think about. The folks that love the world and the things that are in the world. Praise the Lord. The marriage supper is ready, Brother Johnny. And it won't be long if we will just keep our wedding garment white. We can step out of this place and appear in the presence of the Lamb of God with exceeding joy. That invitation is beautiful, isn't it? Glory, glory, glory. I hope you received something this morning from the Word of God. I enjoyed it. I appreciate the brethren and sisters that have come out to be with